What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, Pike, to the HQ. Happy Saturday. I hope your weekend's going well. I hope you've been extremely productive. I hope you haven't spent too much money. But if you have, that's okay because we are going to make you that money back. I saw a play this week that we are going to absolutely smash. If you are new to the channel, my name is Nicholas. I'm usually on video, but as I've said the last 32 weeks in a row, my OBS streaming software uh, just crashes every single time I open it up. So this is going to be a podcast version. The second half of this video will be the best DFS and DraftKings plays of the week with my man's Joe Holka. We're going to start off with some monkey knife fight action, which is the best place on the interwebs to lay down some player prop bets. Now they take, it's a lot of fun. So head over to monkeyknifefight.com, monkeyknifefight.com, throw 10 bucks into your account, use promo code BDGE when you sign up and you will get a 100% deposit match bonus. I threw $50 onto the account. We're going to spend it all today. Now, obviously, we're going to focus on football. If you're good with basketball, baseball, hockey, whatever, you can pound the sports book and win some money that way. But today, what we're going to do is something that we haven't done yet. I didn't even realize that they had this, to be honest with you. Rather than picking an individual game, we're actually going to go to the star shootouts, this little section down there. What we're going to do is look at the touchdown dance. Now, there are tons of player prop bets that you can do on here that relate to fantasy points, that relate to receptions, passing yards, over-under. You can get onto monkeyknifefight.com and mess around with it if you think you could take advantage of something. With Touchdown Dance, basically, you pick three players in the slate, and they have to add up to a certain amount of touchdowns. Get over two and a half touchdowns, you're going to one and a half times your money. If you get over three and a half touchdowns, which is four touchdowns, you're going to 4x your money. I'm looking at these players. I'm seeing Josh Jacobs. He's going against the Cincinnati Bengals. We're going to say, yes, mother fudging sir to Josh Jacobs. We have Tevin Coleman going against the Arizona Cardinals with Matt Breda out. Coleman is going to get 100% of the goal line touches that are down there. He's going to get, he's going to be the big back. So Jacobs against Cincinnati, Tevin Coleman against the Cardinals. Now with the third player, you can get cute. I'm going to stick to what we know. And that is that Sony Michelle. See, this is the best part about trying to project the Patriots. When you try to project them like a normal person, you say, ah, you know, the Patriots are very good at passing the ball. They've been bad on the ground. On the flip side of things, we get Philadelphia, who is absolutely terrible at defending the pass, but they're really good against the ground. So, you know, this seems like a smash spot for Tom Brady and the pass catching weapons over there, which means that it's a big Sony Michelle game. These three guys, I wouldn't hate going with uh, Darren Waller here. I wouldn't hate going with Julian Edelman here, but we're going to go with Josh Jacobs, Tevin Coleman, Sony Michelle, the three workhorse back. Arguably not, not really a workhorse back, but with Matt Breda out, I think he has as much touchdown upside as anyone in the NFL this week. So we're going to go Jacobs. We're going to go Coleman. We're going to go Sony Michelle. Now you want to select how many touchdowns we're going to get out of these guys. If you want to play it safe, it seems like the three of them will combine for three touchdowns because you could totally see Jacobs going for it. You could see any of these guys going for two touchdowns. And that just means of the other two guys, you just need one touchdown. So it seems like that's almost a guarantee and you're going to one and a half times your money. So if you throw 50 down, we're going to get our 50 back, obviously, plus 75 in return. So I love that. But if you want to get a little more risque, you're going to go three and a half times. You're going to go over three and a half touchdowns and go four extra money. That's what we're going to fucking do today. It is a big, big day in the HQ. We're going to hit this and then we're going to make some upgrades at the HQ. We're going to buy some new hardware and that's only going to make your viewing experience that much more pleasurable. I'm probably lying. I'm probably going to spend that $200 on like fucking six candles from anthropology. That's what we're going to do. Three and a half touchdowns need to be scored between Sony Michelle, Tevin Coleman, Josh Jacobs. We're going to 4X our prize and we're going to throw 50 on it. Should I do it on the 15X? Should I try to 15X this and go for $750? No, I'm not going to get that crazy. All right. So right after I submitted that, I was like, Nick, you are extremely mentally incapable of preparing correctly for your videos because I realized that we were only looking at the late games. Now, the early games, oh my goodness. But look at the options that we have. Christian McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, and Zeke. Good Lord. Zeke going up against the Detroit Lions. The last time the Lions stopped a running back might have been in 2014. We have Zeke going against the Lions. We have C-Mac, who it doesn't even fucking matter who he's going against, but he's going against the Falcons. Dalvin Cook. Going against the Broncos at home. Obviously, that's not an easy matchup, but they're very good against the pass. Not fantastic against the run. So, I thought the afternoon games were good, but God damn! C-Mac, Dalvin Cook, Zeke. So, you know what I did? I threw in another 3750 They hit me with that 100% deposit match bonus. So, we threw another 75 on the account. Goal two and a half. Goal three and a half. Goal four and a half. As you can see, the multiplier is a little lower for obvious fucking reasons. We're going to go with three and a half X. We're going to put 
D hole. Oh, they don't let you put custom amounts in. Whatever. We're gonna go with 50 in here, and we're gonna win 150. So I apologize for jumping the gun, but damn, I hope y'all watch the remainder of the video so that you didn't do the afternoon games because the morning games. Good lord. Submit. Let's get this bread. All right, so we got two touchdown dances in right now, and we're gonna come away with a whole lot of money. I might even give away 50 bucks. You know what? I'll probably give away a couple, couple free sweatshirts. That's what I'll do. I'll give away a couple big dog sweatshirts. Y'all will be able to pick something on the big dog store, which is on bigdogsfantasy.com. Head over to the shop section. So what I'm going to do is if you do use the promo code BDGE, send me a screenshot, whether it's on Instagram or on Twitter at Nick underscore BDGE for Twitter. Uh, it's just my name, Nick Ercolano on Instagram or the Big Dogs Fantasy account, which is Big Dogs Fantasy on Instagram. Send me a DM uh, of a picture of you using the promo code BDGE when you sign up and the touchdown dance and y'all will be entered automatically into winning a free sweatshirt from the brand. Go smash these touchdown dance totals. I love y'all. Goodbye. All right, welcome y'all to the DFS portion of the video. We got my man's Joe Holka, and we are filming during the day again, and, and we normally say that that gives us a lot of energy, but uh, both of us, it was a long night, so I was really hoping that uh, you could carry me this episode, but now I see you got scruff on your face, so clearly uh, you're not in tip-top shape. You, said, <laughs> you went to the Minnesota Wild game last night, I'm like, Joe looks like he's in about the same shape that I am. So I, we apologize for the energy levels if they happen to be down a little bit today. Yeah, if you happen to see like just the beard growing out, it's not because I think it looks good. It's more, I guess, like laziness. And that's kind of what happened this week. Like shout out DraftKings. Uh, they gave me some tickets to the wild game last night. Uh, they probably just feel bad for me for all the money that I lost last week in DFS <laughs> with Saquon Barkley. Uh, so I still think that they came out net ahead when it comes to that. But yeah, a little rough around the edges today. But the good news is all my research is done on Thursdays for the most part. Fridays is just trying to monitor news and whatnot. So it's a little bit more of a low key day. Okay. Yeah. And, and just for the record, I didn't mean your beard looked bad. I just meant that <laughs> like I, I knew that it was a lazy thing for you because you're oh, yeah. clean shaven. So I was like, okay, he probably had himself a little bit of a night. Got a little ahead of myself with the margaritas and stayed out a little bit too late. But that will not stop us from delivering. DFS, the DraftKings value to y'all today. Let's talk quarterbacks. We got Lamar Jackson at the helm, 7,700. We're talking about running back wide receiver prices, but it's almost like, do we fade him against this Houston secondary who is just letting up an enormous amount of points um, to opposing quarterbacks? There are some other interesting guys on the slate, but I kind of want to just start from the top and maybe work our way down. Uh, yeah. Will you be playing Lamar Jackson in your lineup? I almost feel like he's worth paying up for because it, it, the upside is, is crazy that he that he could deliver in a shootout game like this, possibly. Yeah, you're basically getting like uh, half the equity you get from a running back from this guy at this point, which is crazy. Like last week, he didn't even play even close to a full game, still scored 30 DraftKings points. Like Cincinnati's not really trying to win, it seems like at this point. Um, but yeah, like Lamar Jackson, 7,700. He's so much more expensive than everyone else. Like we talked about him last week. Like if you got the salary, like of course, like r run out Lamar Jackson. This week, at least early in lineup construction, it, it might be tough to get there. Uh, it, like this is what we see every for these people for people that are coming over from season long. We see this about every single season on DraftKings. Like halfway through the year, pricing gets really tight because we do have more information about these guys. But they also like it's based on ownership too. So if people just keep running out Lamar Jackson at sixty six hundred and he's thirty percent owned. DraftKings doesn't want that. So. Um, they try and like it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like a betting market where they really try and get um, as much action on both sides as they can. So they have to price these guys up, and we'll see the same thing with Michael Thomas when we get to wide receiver. So Lamar Jackson, he's a phenomenal play, home favorite, nice team total. We know what he's going to give us on the ground, all of that. So I think he's fine if you can get there. It's just really tough to get there if you if you do want to move down a little bit. Um, Deshaun Watson, the same game, I think will be uh, a lot. Uh, less popular uh, I don't think that it's near as good of a spot of course um, but I think Deshaun Watson in tournaments uh, makes a decent pivot all the way up there um, I doubt I make it at there at that point um, I think at 6600 Josh Allen against Miami is interesting I, I kind of have blinders for this guy I, I still like have like this view of Josh Allen as someone that's like going to push the ball downfield but it is Miami Miami is a, a matchup that um, I mean we just always want to target one of the things that I really like about this spot for Josh Allen in particular is he's someone that doesn't handle pressure very well but Miami has the the worst pressure rate over the last five games than any team in the entire league so shout out sports info solutions they just give me a bunch of a uh, awesome pressure rate data on both sides of the ball um so Josh Allen 6600 he's pretty expensive probably because of the matchup and he's going to draw some ownership 
he's on the road, but um, we haven't seen Josh Allen in like a good game environment in a while, just because it's been so cold in Buffalo. So like in Miami, I could see this being a game where, where Josh Allen kind of has a little bit of a bounce back spot. Um, he's still, I'm projecting him for about 40 rushing yards on the ground. So that's, that's pretty elite as well. So I like him quite a bit. Um, I guess I'll let you touch on some of these guys at the top end. So Lamar, if you got the salary, but I think Josh Allen over Deshaun Watson for me this week, as crazy as that sounds. No, I, I kind of like that pivot with <clears throat> Josh Allen. Cause we, like you said, we talked, we talked about it last week a little bit, how we'd been more of a, a floor, <coughs> a floor play than a ceiling play. Yeah. He did have a good week last week though. And I, I I mean, you got to like the matchup in Miami. So that's um, that's good. I also think someone like um, even Derek Carr, who he had he had, had like four or five straight games of <clears throat> really good production prior to last week, and now he's in a, a really good spot against Cincinnati at home. They are big favorites, so this could be a game where they give the ball to Josh Jacobs like 25 times. But I'm a fan of Derek Carr down at 6,100. But if you want to pay even further down the list, I mean, Kyle Allen against that. Oh, yeah. At home, 5,300. I mean, DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel are both, I feel like, on the peak of, of breakout games here. And if there's ever going to be a spot to do it, it's got to be against Atlanta, right? Yeah. So I do a first look video on YouTube for every position each week, but I do it live on Twitch and um, on every Tuesday at 3 p.m. each time anyone wants to drop in for that. But Kyle Allen is the guy that, I thought it was going to be like a little bit less pop because no one wants to play this guy. This is the first time anyone's right. really brought him up as being like a chalk play for most of the year. But 5,300 does so much for your, your roster this week. And we talked about all these Carolina guys that are in great spots. It is Atlanta. Like I'm more on the side that last week, Atlanta versus New Orleans, like that seems more of like the outlier scenario for me. Like I think that was just a weird game. I'm still totally fine attacking Atlanta, of course. Like Vegas seems to agree. Matt, pretty massive total for Carolina at home um, and anytime we just love the weapons on a team I mean it's fine to roll out the quarterback especially at a, a low price tag so he's kind of the guy that um, I guess I mean he's not going to give you much on the ground doesn't throw deep but really like where you attack Atlanta is kind of the short area of the field anyway so I could just see like his weapons honestly just like getting him there Christian McCaffrey DJ Moore and some of these like shorter passes with a little bit of yak um, I think the price tag is why he's so popular and the matchup so I, I haven't played Kyle Allen um, all season but this does seem like a, a pretty great spot to go there um, I was hoping that he'd be a little bit more sneaky but it sounds like he's going to be the chalk but I think it's basically a, a roster construction thing at this point I was about to say yeah if, if I'm if I'm rolling in here like half in the bag and I don't even play DFS and I'm, I'm getting excited about Kyle yeah I don't know his ass is very popular but I think you need to have like a wide spectrum of quarterbacks this week I think if I'm making lineups I'm probably making one with Lamar or like you said Josh Allen at the top and then one with Kyle Allen, because when you get to the running back situation this week, I think there's a lot of interesting plays. So it, it feels like you might need to have C-Mac and Zeke in your lineup because their matchups are ridiculous. Like you, you can't fade C-Mac at 10-5 at going against Atlanta because, like you said, I mean, they just donate uh, passes to the running back position. So he needs to be in every lineup pretty much. The running backs after that are, are interesting because Zeke's going against Detroit. And Detroit is allowing the single most fantasy points to running backs on the year. But those are the two most expensive running backs. So it's like what you do after them is what's going to make your lineup. I mean, it seems like Brian Hill will be the chalkiest play this week, and he will probably be in all of my lineups as the Atlanta workhorse down at 4,800. But the players in between them seem interesting. I don't want to go for Dalvin Cook this week. It doesn't seem like a good matchup for Denver when you have the two top guys, both in really good matchups. But I think like Josh Jacobs against Cincinnati is super interesting. Um, I think that even Tevin Coleman with Matt Breda out against Arizona gets interesting. I really like Devin Singletary against Miami. I think he's someone coming off a game that was a little bit disappointing, but this seems like a week where he would get right again against uh, the Dolphins week front seven. And he's a guy who's been very, very, very underratedly involved in the passing game. He's like really operating as a three down guy. Frank Gore is more so a breather back at this point. But if things click right for Devin Singletary, he gets a goal line carry or two, takes one big play in the passing game, like he could put up those 20, you know, DK points for you. I also think right below him, Joe Mixon is a little bit interesting uh, with Oakland because we just saw how heavily involved they want to, uh, they want their running backs to be with Ryan uh, Finley under center. So things can get interesting in Cincinnati from a volume standpoint. I think that's what you look for. 
But, you know, the fact that we do have Brian Hill at 4,800 almost seems like he gives you that leverage to go up and get guys like C-Mac and Zeke. So what is your take behind C-Mac? Because obviously he's got to be in your lineup, right? Yeah, you're you're on a lot of the same guys that I am, uh, which is good. We're, we're aligned there. I think the the last guy at quarterback before we move on that I want to touch on too, Jeff Driscoll at 4,600. He's extremely cheap. Um, and again, yeah, yeah. We, we talk about – we talk about weapons and guys that can get there just based on their weapons alone. We saw what Kenny Galladay did for him last week. So Driscoll was 48, 4,100 last week, and he still got almost 20 DK points and only had one touchdown because he does give you a little bit on the ground as well. I haven't projected for just under 20 rushing yards. So like that's another path. If you don't want to play Kyle Allen, that's another path to getting to Christian McCaffrey. So Christian McCaffrey at 10, five, same price as he was last week, but Honestly, in this spot against Atlanta, I would have considered him probably at like 11K. It sounds crazy oh, yeah. to even say that, but it's just like such an amazing spot. I think it's uh, he's the priority on this slate. Um, Michael Thomas is all the way up to 9,900, which we'll get to. Um, definitely prefer just paying another 600 for Chris McCaffrey if you get in a spot where you need one of those guys. Um, I guess we're a little bit, uh, I think where we differ at the top is I, I still think Dalvin Cook is okay. Um, at 8,900, Zeke's worries me a little bit, man. And I think Zeke's going to be lower owned actually than Dalvin Cook this week. Because you think this uh, is a trap game for Zeke? I almost feel it like it might be. I think so. I, I'm feeling that. I don't know why. I just, I'm a little bit nervous on his usage and just how bad he's looked. I guess maybe that's a little bit of bias just because like he hasn't done much in some like prime time spots this year, but like three targets, man. Like he had a game where he had zero targets two weeks ago. I get like his, his usage on the ground is totally fine, but. I don't know, man. It just seems like he might be a little bit too expensive at 9K um, on this slate. So I, I think that he'll actually be the lowest owned of that group at the top. Dalvin Cook, he's like the complete opposite. Every time he's on a prime time spot, he just goes completely nuclear. So yeah, um, I, think the that, I think that doesn't even matter at this point. Yeah. And the thing with Zeke, too, it's, it's getting to the point where he's not involved enough in the passing game that you need him to score touchdowns for him. He, has to, to. he, he needs to score almost two touchdowns to return value on that 9,000 price tag. I think there's guys like that for cheaper, like some of the ones that you mentioned, like Josh Jacobs, 6,900. Like, I don't know if he's that much different of a play. Like, I mean, he's against Cincinnati, good spot. Yeah. Um, the touches, like, I'm projecting them for, like, a very similar amount of touches. So, at that point, take the savings. Um, Tevin Coleman is 6,100. I haven't played this guy all year, but um, he is a home favorite, massive total. It's Arizona. Like, I, I think that Coleman is really interesting at that price tag, and I almost never say that um, yeah. since we do have Breda out. So, I think both of those guys, like, from a point per dollar perspective, almost make more sense to me this week than Zeke. I'm trying to piece my way through Leonard Fournette. Fournette, by the way, if you get anyone's playing on FanDuel, Fournette's price on FanDuel is completely egregious. He's 7,200 over there. You get basically a 3K in savings off of Christian McCaffrey, uh, Christian McCaffrey, which is pretty crazy. It's not a great matchup, but I mean, Indy can be beat on the ground. They're very strong against uh, running backs in the passing game, but just from a pure volume and touchdown regression standpoint, like Fournette, on FanDuel, I think is uh, pretty close to a lock at that price. On, on DraftKings, a little bit tougher, 7,900, but um, I think that he's still totally fine. So I think those are the guys at the top. Like, I think Dalvin Cook, Chris McCaffrey are going to be the, the priorities for me. I think the really popular roster construction is going to be both of those guys and Brian Hill. Um, so I would be shocked if those weren't like, if that wasn't most people's running back core, but then you're not going to be able to play Julio, who's a priority this week as well. So if we move down, to some of these other guys, I, I like Brian Hill quite a bit. I mean, he was kind of a bell cow back in college, Carolina. We know you can run on them. Um, I, I don't know if this is just like the, the complete layup spot, just because like what if they do get some of these other guys involved a little bit? Like, I don't know. It, it, it still seems like there's a little bit of unknown there, but 4,800, you're, uh, you're getting a decent amount of discount there. Uh, Joe Mixon, I, I've never seen a team run so much while they're behind last week. Do you have any opinions on what they were doing? That was I was, uh, yeah, I, I, in a video earlier this week, I asked someone to check the numbers historically and being down, I, I needed to know what the most carries were for an opposing running back being down by 30 or 25 points or whatever it was. Nuts. I don't think I got an answer. I didn't read through all the comments, but I can't imagine there's ever been a game where Someone saw 30 carries while being down 30 points. It makes no fucking sense. But it tells you what their game – like, they don't trust this quarterback. Well, it was like they were down, but he still only saw three targets. Like, the guy, like – or yeah. literally, like, didn't even see a lot through the air, which is crazy. But the price tag's nice. So, I think Joe Mixon, like, I don't know. I, I I've personally have a really hard time playing a, a running back as a – uh, ten and a half point underdog. Uh, I get it. It's Oakland, all of that. But I probably won't be there for that. Larger field play, maybe a millimaker type play is probably okay. 
Singletary, I think, is too expensive, but I, I agree with you for everything you said. Like, he's a guy that is involved in the pass game. I'm not so much um, worried as much, I guess, about Gore as I have been in the past because he's kind of uh, separated himself a little bit, which is nice to see because yeah. Singletary is a guy that, that's pretty talented. I was really hoping that Singletary would, like, come across in the projections, like, at least a little bit closer to 20 touches. I don't have him near that at this point. Maybe I'll bump him up a little bit. He's a guy that's going to have to get there on efficiency, but, like, I mean, the matchup's great. He's a guy that's involved in the air. So, again, I, I think he's a little bit overpriced. Like, I think Tevin Coleman significantly better in that range. Let me uh, – there's a couple other guys that could be in play, probably not for the games that you play per se, but maybe bigger fields and GPPs and things like that because we've had a few uh, injuries pop up over the last 24, 48 hours. One, David Montgomery rolled his ankle and then did not practice the following day. I have no idea what they have in that backfield outside of him. It's Terry Cohen behind him, and they let go of Mike Davis a couple of weeks ago. So I'm looking like I'm trying to find, are they bringing up a practice squad guy? Like, yeah. who is the next guy up? So it seems like Terry Cohen would be a lot more involved, and he might be interesting in GPPs. And on the flip side, the former Bear, Jordan Howard, has, I don't know what a stinger is apparently, but he um, is very questionable for this week, too. Really tough matchup against the Patriots, but that would almost – and Darren Sproles is just put on the IR. So that would almost make Miles Sanders the workhorse here. So um, Miles Sanders, I think, is really, really cheaply priced, almost 4100 right now. So I think he becomes super interesting as someone maybe you throw into your flex play if you need to get down uh, in price. If you do go Zeke and C-Mac or something and you need to pivot from Brian Hill. You know, if Jordan Howard's out, I, I don't think Miles Sanders sees uh, a workload that's so much – less than Brian Hill, you know? So what, what what are your takes on those guys if the uh, running backs ahead of them end up missing? Yeah, uh, missing I think game? that – I think the Philly one's interesting. I will say that uh, Chicago not on the main DraftKings slate because they are the, the right. Sunday night football game. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that would have been an interesting one just because we know three cones uh, so involved. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't dug into that one as deep. But I, I think that the Philly situation is interesting. I, I don't know, targeting New England – um feels kind of bad i mean I, I know that they're they're at home um so i don't know i think that that's one like if you wanted to pivot off of brian hill um you probably could at, at that point I, I think there's probably some other guys in that range but yeah i, I think that that one would make some sense from just a, a touch perspective but it seems like it's relatively unclear singer is a neck injury i believe so that doesn't yeah. sound great but i don't think it's a longer term uh type of thing so yeah i'll have to piece my way through that um Ronald Jones did you see him catching seven balls last week because that just buried me because I had him uh very significantly behind uh Damian Williams and uh who was the other cheap running back last week oh Montgomery last week I had both those guys pretty far ahead of him and just got smoked um because Ronald Jones was popular against Arizona but um yeah he's coming out of nowhere like guy hasn't really caught balls since high school and just seven catches out of nowhere that was no, brutal. it made no sense he like he like doubled his career reception total out of his entire his life total basically with those receptions but i mean it's good to see if you're a rojo owner but yeah how are you, how are you gonna count on that i don't know that was i don't a, think he can and definitely not going back to the well against new orleans this week uh in that spot if people want to go there that's fine i don't have him anywhere near the amount of touches as some of these other guys we talked about yeah, no. I mean, there's always the, they're always going to give Peyton Barber eight to ten carries, man. That's always going to happen, and it's like it's a toss up for who's going to get the passing down work. They did say he's going to be more involved going forward in the passing work as well. But what does that mean? He could get four targets next week and catch two of yeah. them for 19 yards. So yeah, I'm not, Rojo's not a guy I'm necessarily looking to uh, dig in on. But in that same offense, if we pivot over to the wide receivers, you know that game is interesting from a wide receiver perspective because, like you said, Michael Thomas ninety nine hundred. We rarely see the yeah. wide receivers get up to this price, but at this point, I mean, he's been so consistent, and you're not going to find a better matchup than against Tampa Bay. Um, I, it, it's going to be very hard to get him into your lineup with the C Max and the Zeeks and, and those expensive running backs up there. On the flip side, you get a twenty five hundred dollar discount on either of the Tampa Bay wide uh, wide receivers and Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. Marshawn Lattimore is dealing with this hamstring injury. He missed practice this week. It does not look like he's going to suit up. So what are we doing? Are we going with New Orleans and their number one? Are we pivoting away? Are we looking at Tampa Bay? I mean, I can't imagine you're fading this game altogether, right? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a really hard game to fade for sure. I, I, prefer, I prefer the Carolina-Atlanta game, I think. But this Tampa Bay-New Orleans game is definitely uh, pretty enticing. Michael Thomas at 9,900. This is like a pure spot that I normally try and – ignore uh but like you said he's had 
his consistency this year has been kind of off the charts. So you have to at least consider him. The only roster constructions that's going to work is if you fade one of the top price backs, um, which personally I don't, I don't typically do. Um, but I do think that Michael Thomas at 9,900 might even go under own. Cause I think there's people that just won't play him for that price. Um, so it's pretty amazing spot for him. Like, yeah. And like last time we saw him in a spot like this against Arizona, he gets like smashed. Right. So, I mean, I think that, uh, Michael Thomas still totally fine. I mean, he's probably, uh, the number one option if you wanted to go to the New Orleans side of the ball for me, for sure. Um, Kamara still feels a little bit too expensive. He, he might be hurt, man. He's, he's just not breaking off some of the, the big runs he did last Definitely year. Definitely hurt, yeah. I, I mean, they're going to keep involving Latavius. The, I mean, yeah. the, the high ankle sprain he had, he needed weeks to, yeah. to let that heal. Um, one of the guys that comes on the channel, Dr. Morse, was saying that for a while. And he's like, even after the bye, he's still going to be dealing with it at 80% or whatever. And that's it takes long to heal because every time you step back yeah. on the field and get 15 touches, you know, you kind of – Maybe you don't fully re-aggravate it, but it definitely doesn't give it more time to heal that way. So Latavius is going to continue to be involved. Yeah, and it's it's not even close to the same thing. But used to I used to play hockey, minor pro hockey, totally different. But I had some ankle stuff in one season, and like you said, like it takes so like you have to literally like if you take one wrong step, even like if you're outside, like literally one wrong step, you're like a week behind like where you were before. Yeah. Like it, it's like that much of like a reoccurring thing, and that's not even trying to cut like. Uh, you know, on an NFL football field. So totally different. Um, so I'm not really in on that. Uh, so Michael Thomas is the guy I think that would make a lot of sense in terms of the Tampa Bay guys. Like it's kind of a cop out at this point, but like, I can't differentiate these two guys in, in certain spots. And every time I try to, I just get buried. So um, it makes me want to just like fade the situation altogether and let other people just like chase this the rest of the season. Like the guy in that price range, I, I think is Julio uh, this week, especially if Bradbury's out. Uh, Julio Chalk is always scary because it, whenever he's in these like amazing spots, I feel like it never works out. Is Julio um, but, even like chalky at this point anymore in DFS? I feel like he he hasn't given yeah. two week upside to the point where it's like his ownership. I can't imagine is that high, right? It, I think it will be this week just because like you get a two K difference in salary on the Michael Thomas. I think people will talk themselves into that because a lot of people are going to play Carolina. So you're going to need someone on the other side, and if uh, you are, I mean, most people are playing Josh Hill. I'm sure. But if you wanted to kind of flip that game script a little bit and play Julio, like 7,500 is someone that people are going to talk themselves into. I think he'll be more heavily owned than the Tampa Bay guys for sure. I think he'll be uh, more heavily owned than DeAndre Hopkins, all of those guys. So um, I'm in on Julio. I also like acknowledge that um, it's a spot that like he's failed in in the past. So like what I always kind of remember about Julio, and by the way, they might just not have anyone that can stop him if he ends up seeing this, this target share that, that Hooper leaves behind like everyone thinks right. that this Russell get this gauge guy could be a decent value play which I think is fine too but um, if all of that goes to Julio like he's the guy that you have to have on this slate so you have to make that clear but uh, maybe Carolina just like tries to use two guys to just completely take him away I'm not sure if that's going to work but um, we've seen these like great spots for Julio and him fail just because like they they literally sell out to stop him with two two guys have a guy over the top all of that so it's an interesting spot at the top of wide receiver this week i think that like michael thomas really hard to get to julio jones getting pretty chalky so i think it's a, it's a tough decision yeah i mean norleans does a good job always of taking away julio or at least you know for the most part they do what they yeah. do is usually they'll they'll take the number one and put them on to ridley or the number two wide receiver yeah. they'll take the number two cornerback throw him on julio i think that's what i'm safety, picturing it yeah. play a safety yeah. over the top yeah so they do a good job with that um but carolina's been uh, a team that's kind of like a run funnel, but like you said, you know, Freeman out, Hooper out, Sanu gone. It's like eventually Julio's going to be destined for one of these monster games that like, you know, literally wins you a million dollars. So this could actually yep. be the week. Uh, on the flip side of things, right, if we're talking about chalky players, if you need to pay down at wide receiver, uh, not necessarily paying down, but DJ Moore, right, for Carolina seems like uh, – I can't imagine he's not one of the highest on wide receivers this week at 5,900. The guy has been last five games, 11 targets, 10 targets, eight targets, nine targets, 10 targets, hundred yards, back-to-back -back games. The guy hasn't scored since week three. So he's sitting with one touchdown on the year, but he's pacing out to almost 1300 total yards and like a hundred receptions. So if there's going to be a game where he can, you know, find the end zone and kind of break out and really come onto the scene, at 5,900, he's going to have a big game, and then he's going to go up to 6,800, like somewhere in that range. And I feel like this is the week you, you probably have to get in on DJ Moore, although he's going to be so highly owned. Same with Debo Samuel. 
here in San Francisco. If Sanders misses this game, George Kittle misses the game. We saw D- Debo Samuel finally have a big game last week, and now people are kind of taking notice. And I think he's all the way down at uh, 4K. Yeah, yeah because he was cheap. one of the later slate games, so they priced him early. Uh, mm-hmm. So it seems like those two guys are probably the chalkiest in my eyes. How are you feeling about them? And are there any other guys that you think are chalky that I'm probably missing? Yeah, DJ Moore, it seems like just like the layup play of the entire week. And it sucks because, like, there's a very clear path this week. Like, these Carolina guys, like, I don't know what they did with the pricing. Like, but, like, Curtis Samuel, DJ Moore, all these guys, like, even, like, Greg Olson, like, they're all underpriced. So, like, just yeah. it's going to be so popular to stack up that game. So, in tournaments, like, like pivoting away from it would make some sense. But, like, if you're just trying to build what you think is the best team, 5,900 for DJ Moore, he's just way too cheap. Like you said, like, 6,800 is probably, like, closer to where he should be if he had a little bit um, more touchdown luck I, I struggle a little bit more with Curtis Samuel just because he's like he's the air yards guy but he's like a smaller type of like wide receiver too and he just hasn't really gotten there this yeah. year um, he hasn't been really uh, taking advantage of those deeper targets maybe that says more about uh, Kyle Allen than it says about uh, Curtis Samuel but I, I think that Curtis Samuel is probably my least favorite of the the Carolina guys like DJ Moore lock and load him um, I think he's He's in play for sure. And DJ, DJ, or sorry, Debo Samuel, 4K, like it's a price thing too. Like you need, you need guys like that. And this week, it seems like he's one of the ones that would help you get to some of these studs. Um, I think he's super interesting down there. Um, I, I think if you really wanted to kind of get cute, uh, you could mess around uh, with someone like Auden Tate at 4,200. Uh, we'll see what happens with, is AJ Green going to play? Have we heard yet? No, I'm, I'm, I would look, put, a significant amount of the income I have in my bank that he doesn't play this year, the entire okay. year. I don't think Green, he's, de- he's definitely not going to play this, this week, but I don't yeah. think he plays the entire year. Um, okay. And Curtis Samuel, I, I think we're going to learn a lot about who he is over the this, this second half of the year because he actually is getting a lot of targets. I think he's sixth Fun. in the NFL in deep targets right now, but I'm looking on player. Pro- I was looking on player profile and he ranks like outside of the top 90 in terms of target accuracy, quality target rating, so it's a lot falling on Curtis uh, on Kyle Allen in terms of his accuracy. But uh, Adam Leviton said something uh, funny in, in this week's Established the Run podcast that he took it from someone else who said it. And we're like, yeah, Curtis Samuel's getting so much opportunity that he's either on the precipice of like breaking out in a major way because the opportunity is there. Or maybe he's just not that good at football, you know? Because sure. like, yeah, it's, it's like one or the other. <laughs> it's one or the other. And we always think of like air yards and opportunity. We're like, oh, they're destined to break out. The buy low, the buy low, the buy low. Sometimes, you know, these guys just aren't who we want them to be. But I feel like Curtis Samuels, um, the flashes that he's shown and just his athletic profile, right? Like, he's not that small. He's like 5'11", 195 pounds or something. So, he's yeah. got enough size to be outside. And the four three one speed tells you that he is a very, very elite NFL caliber athlete. So, I, if I had to side with one way or the other, it's that Kyle Allen is killing him in terms of his deep ball production. Yeah, I buy that for sure. Um, I think the other guy, I mean, I did mess, mention Russell Gage earlier. He's 3,300. So at that point, like getting access to this game with a really cheap asset again, like it just, it's crazy because there's going to be so much ownership in that game. Um, but it feels optimal. If you're trying to build an optimal build, like those are the guys that that stand out for sure. Uh, do you have any takes on like Terry McLaurin, Cortland Sutton? Like those guys are really popping and weighted opportunity. They're, they're probably underpriced, but like their quarterback situations are just, not great uh the matchups are just not ideal either but like from like if you're trying to pivot off these guys in tournaments like i'm trying to figure out who those guys would be so those are guys at least i'm trying to kind of piece my way through this week so i I was thinking about Cortland sutton a lot this week um from a fantasy football perspective because Mm -hmm. i'm I'm trying to figure out whether or not to start him and i'm gonna lean on the side that he's gonna bust this week because he so we have brandon allen coming in we know he's not a good quarterback right from nfl standards Sutton had this one big week, and I, I when I make my videos in the beginning of the year, season long, after week one or week two, trying to tell yeah. people not to panic about their players, I think about it like, okay, if your player has a really big week one, right? Like you give him a lot of le- you give him a lot of leeway for like three weeks after that because you think about sure. week one and that's your first impression. If they have a week a bad week one, then you're automatically down and you're worried about him. And I'm just like, the first thing I do is like, okay, take week one and take week two and switch them and then statistically and then think about how you would view the player and that's what I'm thinking about Cortland Sutton people are getting really high on him and they're like okay he's fine he's safe with Brandon Allen and I'm like I don't think that's the case because I feel like what's going to happen is he's going to have a down game in this week and we all could have just as easily seen that coming last week 
And I wonder if Sutton had the game that he had last week this week and a bad game last week, like we would still not feel good about Sutton going into the next week. I don't know if that made any sense, but in my head it made a lot of sense. And yeah. I think we're I think we're we're thinking he's too safe of a play when in reality he still has Brandon Allen at quarterback. And uh I'm a little nervous about Sutton. On the flip side, I think I think uh, I think I kind of like Terry this week. I talked myself into it. Um, as someone who owns a lot nice. of Terry in season long, he was a big pickup for me in week one. I was really excited about it. And now with Haskins at quarterback, I'm like, fuck, like that totally ruins all the stock I had in Terry. But I love when people say that, though, because it just makes me want to play this guy at like 3%. Exactly. And that's what's going to happen. Everyone is going to fade, which makes me feel better about him. I mean, he's going against the Jets, and there's no way that he doesn't come up with a few big plays. And they were reporting that they want to move him around more, right, and get him more involved mm-hmm. in the offense. Coming off the bye, that kind of statement to me is big because you know that they have a few plays in place, in plan, right, that they've been working on for two weeks now. And Dwayne has yeah, had a little point. bit has he's had a little bit of time to get familiar with the offense. Do I think he's going to come out and look awesome? Probably not. But I still think that it's going to be a game plan tailored towards getting Terry McLaurin a little bit more involved. So I think the target numbers will go back up. And if Haskins can get lucky and hit him on one or two deep strides, I think we see a big game out of Terry. Yeah, I think he – man, I love that call just because I, I think that – like, he might be the DJ Moore pivot, as crazy as that sounds, just because, like, their price so close together. And DJ Moore is going to be so chalky. But, like, in a larger field tournament, like, I, I think McLaurin is interesting. Like, if you see me in a high-dollar tournament this week with, with McLaurin, so basically putting all my hopes and dreams into Haskins, and then if I end up going all the way down to Jeff Driscoll – like it could, I could win everything, or it could be just a complete disaster. But like, yeah, I don't know. Let's roll. You got to play to win, right? So no, I'm in, I'm kind of in on that. He's he's on the buy. He's not, he's definitely a buy low as far as the air yards and all that is concerned too. So uh, matchup couldn't be much better. Like I mean, this is a team that like 29th in the league at defending the deep pass. So I'm in. I'm in on Terry McLaurin. Nice price, low ownership. I think that's the guys you kind of take shots on. I can't wait to see. McLaurin like develop as an actual NFL receiver yeah. once he gets a like a real quarterback hopefully Dwayne is good because man he, he's been so good and it's crazy how some of these receivers like it's like him and like the Deontay Johnsons of the world where they come in it's like who are these guys they're not really like that athletic and it's like how did they get such high draft capital then you see him play and you're like damn okay this is like what an NFL wide receiver looks like compared to some of the other dudes picking around him so I'm excited to yeah. see him kind of develop as a receiver um, in the NFL. Let's start looking at some of the tight ends. Now, Kittle's the most expensive guy. He's not going to play. Mark Andrews, big game last week, but tough matchup against Houston. He's priced pretty high, so I don't know how uh, how in on Mark Andrews we're we are going to be here. Austin Hooper is going to be out. I like Darren Waller a lot. I think this is an easy bounce back. I feel like his bounce back games are so easy to see coming, and they're always against like <laughs> Bad matchups, or Cincinnati, I mean, good matchups in that sense. Yeah. Um, I, I just think, like, people pivot off. They're like, oh, we should we should sell Darren Waller. I'm like, why? He's getting, like, most of the time 14 targets a game. And he has upside that almost no tight ends in the league have for fantasy. So I like Waller. I love the, uh, the Zach Ertz. Uh, you know, you, you were kind of all over that a couple weeks ago when Deshaun yeah. Jackson was supposedly going to come back. He got re-injured again. But Zach Ertz is interesting this week because I don't think Alshon Jeffrey ends up playing. So I think, really? Alshon, yeah, because he, he tweaked his ankle or something, and he's supposedly on the wrong side of 50-50. So now we have Jeffrey okay. out. Now we have uh, Deshaun Jackson obviously out for the year. We have all these running backs out, so they're probably going to have to go a little more pass-heavy. Plus, they're playing against the Patriots, so they're going to put up points on that. Uh, my, my concern, I guess, with Ertz and what a lot of teams have done in the beginning of the year is, you know, make the game plan to take away Ertz. And it's worked very effectively, obviously. He hasn't put up any production, but – I think they might just force feed him a lot of targets. I like Jared Cook, too. I mean, there's a lot of uh, guys in that middle range I think are, are very viable plays. You could probably pay down. I know your boy uh, Gesicki's got a tough matchup at 3,500. playing against no longer, no longer, He's no longer my boy after he cost well, me a lot of money last week. Okay. The price <laughs> is wrong on Gesicki, I suppose. I think um, if we're paying all the way down – I don't see a lot of names down here. I didn't. I'll be admittedly, I didn't do too much research on the tight ends that are down here. So I'll, I'll throw two of the cheap ones at you, and I just want to get your take before I say a word about them. So the two guys, like, can we play Irv Smith thirty one hundred, Ross Dwelly at thirty four? Those are like the guys that people are talking about paying all the way down for. It seems really thin. 
Uh, I, I'm not on the Irv Smith bandwagon. I feel like people, it, it's just like week in and week out. Everyone's like, I kind of like Irv Smith. I kind of like Irv Smith. It's just like, why? He hasn't like done it. He has shown no yeah. consistency to feel confident about. Dwelly, Dwelly, I actually kind of like. Um, I don't know anything about him. I'm going to so play profile real quick. Yeah, he, he's a super, super unathletic um, <laughs> tight end. But with Kittle out, with San- Sanders out, with Breda out, uh, I believe he saw maybe seven or eight targets last week. He played on like 92% of the snaps and was very involved in the game plan. And you know they want to throw their tight ends. So Dwelly becomes interesting, obviously, because he's playing against the Cardinals, who let up just so many points to the tight end. And it's just a position that Jimmy G wants to have involved in the offense with his playmakers out. So uh, I don't I don't hate Dwelly at all. I know you. I see your face right now, so you're probably <laughs> looking at his, like, athletics on the right Have side. you seen his player profile? Holy, it, this is the bad. worst it, profile I've ever seen. It's bad. It's, it's fucking ugly, yeah, for sure. And uh, that's what will hold a lot of people back, I think. But, I mean, the opportunity is there. So if you're going to pay down, I would probably take Dwelly over uh, Irv Smith. He he ran a four point nine three forty. His best comparable is Cole Hikutini. I can't even say his name. I have no idea who that guy is. So that <laughs> that's that's scary. Even like last week when we were trying to consider if we wanted to pay all the way down for Red Ellison, that seems uh, better than Ross Welly at, at that price. So that that's interesting. Um, I'm with you, man. These guys seem really thin down there. I haven't been on the Irv Smith train. I'm I'm always curious your thoughts too because I know you're you're spending obviously so much of your time like in the season long community. So I'm curious what those people are talking about is like Irv Smith is like a, a pickup, but like on DraftKings, he gets, I don't know. I don't know if there's a much of a ceiling there for him. So um, I'm with you on Darren Waller, 5,500. It feels almost like the earth spot felt a couple weeks ago, right? Because it's like stars align, massive total Cincinnati. They can't defend the tight end, all of that. He's running more routes. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the optimal play, probably Waller. It's gonna be really hard to get there. So I'm, I'm going to try and find something else too. Uh, Mark Andrews, I, I want to mention this too quick because I know we'd like to get a little bit of strategy involved too. So if you're listening to some content, reading some content, and everyone is saying the same thing. So last week, Mark Andrews, oh, he's a pretty good play in a pretty good spot, but he's not running a ton of routes. If you hear everyone say that, that's the time you play a guy in tournaments because um, he's probably a little bit overpriced. No one's going to play him, and then he scores. So like you leverage a lot of the field last week if you play a guy like that. So um, I'm always – I love when I hear it everywhere – because it's just a lot of like kind of group talk. Like everyone just wants to regurgitate some of the same it's, information. It's like those. Yeah. It, it's when you hear, okay. So there's always like these narratives, like the, where like these sharp stats start to come to light. It's like yeah. the Kirk cousins on, on prime time. And then once everybody starts saying it, once like the, those sharp indicators become the public, that's when you fade that shit. That's exactly, that's like a great point right there. It's like, Oh yeah. Kirk cousins always struggles on prime time. It's like, that's when you know, he's about to put up 303 on prime. Yeah. Time. Yeah, and, and it's not the same thing. But this is what made me think of that. Um, one of my buddies, and I don't know if you're big into crypto. I forget if we've ever talked about that. Uh, but he was like towards the top of Bitcoin. He was sitting at a uh, a blackjack table and his blackjack dealer brought it up to him. And he's like, oh, probably time to get out if my blackjack dealer is talking about Bitcoin. And I was like, I'm not kidding. It was like 19K at that point. And he was like, just such a, like, I think about that as like such a sharp kind of game theory thing. Cause like once it starts right. to become like that much of common knowledge and like everyone feels like they has this, like the same kind of take in DFS, that's, that's when kind of to go the other way. Too. It's like when, yeah, it's like term, when the sharp terminology is being used by the mainstream, that's when, you know, you need to start over. going the other it's way. Totally over. So many people yeah. are saying that shit. Yeah. When they don't yeah, even know so- what they're talking about. So this week, um, I, I like Greg Olson quite a bit. Um, I, I understand like his upside might be limited, but his usage is still, I mean, he's leading the entire slate and uh, routes run over the last four games, 139 routes. So I like that. Um, it's, it's Atlanta. Like, like the, the matchup's totally fine from tight end, like basically middle of the pack there. At home, nice total. Like all these Carolina guys are in play. That's kind of scary, I guess, a little bit too, because all these guys feel like they're good plays. Like some of them are not going to get there. Right. Um, so 3,900 is a really nice price tag for him. Gusecki, if you want to just uh, play kind of that, like if, if, if a play is really popular in a week and he fails, no one's going to play him in the next week. But is he really that worse of a play the next week? Probably not. So I think Gusecki at 35 is probably still okay. Um, low total. It's always going to be low for Miami against Buffalo. Not great. Um, but the target share should still be there. So 3,500. So I think he's still okay. Um, tight end feels tough this week. Like I don't have anyone that I just like absolutely love at tight end this week. Like Darren Waller. Like, if you're paying down, Greg Olson, maybe Eric Ebron, something like that. Um, Noah Fant, if you want to take kind of a flyer on a guy, 
um, at 3,700. I think he's okay. People might have kind of forgotten about him um, after the bye, but awful matchup against Minnesota, second best team against tight ends. So it, it's thin, man. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, and I'm looking at the defense right now, and I'm not seeing like too many matchups that I like here either. I think uh, Minnesota is obviously really good. I like Oakland too. I feel like that will be very chalky against Cincinnati, but I think both those teams at 34, 33. Uh, would probably make it into my lineups, both at home, both big favorites, both going against. So expensive, man. I just don't think there's going to be salary for it this week. That's the problem. Like, yeah. That's the biggest problem with defense this week is, like, there's some decent plays, but, like, you're not going to be able to play them. Like, you literally yeah. – like, there's not going to be salary. So who do you who do you like at the <sighs> lower part of, of the salaries? Yeah, yeah. like, I feel like I br- – like, this is probably a play that's on no one's radar for season long, but Arizona is 1,500 against san francisco so like that's one that completely like allows you to get in some of these other plays you're talking about defense is a position you love arizona you love because they pressure they pressure and there's plays and like they're always cheap because they give up points and i don't care about teams that give up points so um i I probably played arizona too much this year what is the uh what is do you know the scoring off the top of your head for defense on DraftKings? I can bring up the exacts, but basically, like the points that are like that you get allowed, like don't matter at all. Like, oh, most really? Of the, most of the defenses are going to give up enough points to where it's like it, it's pretty similar to like normal PPR. But I'm going to bring it up here. Like, okay, because for the most part, I mean, I feel like in the season long, at least on on Yahoo, points allowed is is pretty much like not the biggest indicator, but you know, as soon as you light up a touchdown, it's like minus three points for your defense, and you need to get three sacks in order just to get that back. So when I think yeah. of playing in Arizona or something, that's why that doesn't intrigue me much because in order to make up for the 28 points they're about to allow to San Francisco, it's like you need to have a, like a strip sack, an interception, and another like two sacks just to get that back. I'm like, eh, I don't know if I feel that confident. This looks pretty standard. So like uh, one to six points allowed, you start at seven, yeah. seven to 13, you're at four. So it's pretty similar. Yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I've all the research I've done on this is that none of that stuff really matters. You just really need to try and get um, pressure as far as like getting sacks, like all, all that stuff. That's what really skews everything. Right. So like, uh, like it's the same as like a picks two points, like a sacks one point, but it's really the touchdowns. And if you're going to try and Get touchdowns, the pressure, the pass attempts on the other side, that's what you want. Like, I guess that's the argument against Arizona is San Francisco ideally does want to run. They've been throwing a little bit more uh, in recent weeks. But, uh, yeah, so it's probably thin. But, like, this is a week where, like, we got to try and find something like that. I I think one of the better plays is probably New Orleans at 2,900. Um, I like them quite a bit against Tampa Bay. Like, I like the New Orleans defense a lot just because they pressure a lot. And it is James Winston on the other side. So, I think that's – an interesting one um, at like the, I think Washington against the Jets is I'm mean, intriguing at 2,800 in that same range. I think both of those are, are very close. Like as far as like the optimal play, like it's probably just San Francisco or Buffalo, right? Um, at the top, like against Miami, against Arizona, like those are the ones that they're so expensive. Like if you want to kind of flip roster construction on its head, pay up for one of those. Um, I think that makes some sense. Uh, New England's only 3,500. So I guess that stands out a little bit because they've been so expensive and now they're just not quite as expensive um but once has been a, a quarterback that has been uh, relatively good under pressure historically so um, yeah, not I, so much I, on that this week i feel like this philly offense is going to struggle a lot without all these weapons man because i mean Wentz is good but i don't think he's good enough to you know put the Agreed. pressure on on new england with like nelson Aguilar leading the charge you know what i mean so i kind of right. I, I like new england as as a team that's been priced down a little bit um, I don't know if you're going to be able to get them at your lineup at 3,500 or whatever. But yeah. yeah, you heard it here. Play the Cardinals, win some money, <laughs> pay the mortgage. That's, yeah, don't, uh, don't come at, don't come at me when they get you minus two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, that's what we got for you. Week 11, DraftKings, DFS. Make sure you're following Joe and myself on Twitter. Make make sure you're following Joe everywhere else on the social medias. Those will be linked down below in the description. Joe, thank you for joining us again. And for the rest of y'all, actually, uh, you might be doing the video by yourself next week because I'll be in Charlotte from Thursday to Sunday. So we'll figure that out behind the scenes. But we will see you next Saturday for for one thing or another. Thank you all for joining us today, Joe. Thank you for joining us today as well. Hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're out. Peace.